Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome, everyone, to The Next Level, conversations that propel business. I am your host, Stephen Nooner. And this is Bob Gibbons. And we have a very special show for you guys today. Uh, but before we get into the show, we wanted to talk for to our first-time listeners about what the show is about. So uh, The Next Level is basically about having fun and meaningful conversations uh, where we can all learn from each other um, and each other's experiences in the the rough and tumble world of entrepreneurship and grow and grow together personally, professionally in our businesses and grow the people around us. Sounds cool. Well, we've got a good guest this week. We're excited to talk to Andy Jones. Andy's the founder and president of Jones Commercial Interiors, and uh, they have been in business for 20 years in the Dallas area, and they have 23 employees. And uh, you can find them on the li online at AJCI.com. And uh, one of the distinctions about them is uh, they are, a, as their name says, commercial interiors. They're a, a design firm that designs interior spaces for companies. So office spaces, et cetera. Creative environments for people at work. Oh, very good. Now, one of the cool things is that they were featured in the D Magazine's 2016 coolest business offices in Dallas. Nice. Uh, edition or whatever. And I've been in their offices and I got to tell you, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when I was a kid and I was going to uh, hire a, uh, or get an orthodontist, I went to a guy and he had terrible teeth. I was like, I'm not hiring that orthodontist. So if you're thinking about hiring an architect or an interior designer, go to their office, see what it looks like. <laughs> and if you go to Andy's office, you will be blown away. It is the coolest office. He has a bunch of antique um, travel trailers that are the offices. Well, how about this? Where can we find them online, Bob? Well, I already mentioned that if you were listening. Well, I already <laughs> tuned you out. <laughs> AJCI. But to repeat, AJCI.com. AJCI.com. You know, it helps when you're the host to actually pay attention. Welcome, Andy. I was already like think about what else I wanted to say. Let's, let's hey, we're glad rehash years it. in the room. I'd yes. like to point that out. Three miles, six years. Yes. Well, we like to, uh, <laughs> well, you know, got to have some outtakes. Um, <clears throat> we like to start off with someone else's wisdom. And today, uh, Bob's wife provided, uh, actually, Andy provided the wisdom, but it was written by Bob's wife, and it was, I like long walks, especially when they're taken by people who annoy me. Cute. It was actually <laughs> Noel Coward. <laughs> now, if you want to put that my wife, Jan? Noel Coward, on the same level, I'm totally cool with that, and, and I would say Noel would lose in that battle, but uh, whatever. So, Andy, why do you like that quote? I love that quote because I hate to exercise, and uh, and. Uh, Everyone says uh, I enjoy long walks, and uh, um, I enjoy long walks. I truly enjoy long walks if I'm, you know, somewhere interesting like a beach. But yeah. just walking to walk because it's good for me is is really not something I enjoy. See, the thing um, I got out of that though was he says I like long walks, especially when they are taken by people who annoy me. Meaning <laughs> they they just go ahead and leave, exactly. and they can't annoy me anymore because they're taking a long walk away from me. Because. Normally, that's because you've just told someone to take a walk. Right. <laughs> take a hike. That's, and then you get to enjoy their taking a walk. Right. <laughs> well, let's let's start off with some gratitude. What are you thankful for right now? I am most thankful uh, for my – oh, talk into the mic. <laughs> I am uh, most thankful for my two grown children, uh, Karis and Colin, my, my 27-year-old daughter and my 23-year-old son who uh, – continue to uh, make me very proud every day uh, they're 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 just 
I've enjoyed them uh, from the days they were born and uh, and just continue to. Uh, I, I tell my friends that that who have small children that the uh, the cutest age is 21. <laughs> Why is that? But because it, that's it Independence really Day. <laughs> that's that's the that's the uh, that's the. Um, it just keeps getting better, and as they get older, they get better. And now, you know, these are these are young adults that I enjoy spending time with, I enjoy hanging out with their their friends. You know, we can uh, talk about all kinds of things that you know. You just don't. You just don't really share that kind of relationship with your with your kids when they're teenagers or when they're you yeah. know toddlers. There, there's just you know, um, there's not a uh, there's not a uh, a give and take that you have that that's the same that you have when uh, when they're adults. Something to look I forward really to. Enjoy them. Well, now we also ask you some things about yourself that's unusual, and you told you told us that you had six fingers on your right hand, <laughs> but you don't I really do, do you? I. I don't really, but that is. Uh, I, I do want that message out there. Because that's, that's, a, uh, that's a that's a secret message to my daughter. Wasn't that like the Princess Bride guy, or what, what was that? Yeah. Eight fingers, yeah, six remember. fingers six. on his right hand. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Princess Bride is a has a has a cult following, and my daughter and I are are. Uh, Avid. All right, just to be sure, followers. hold your hold your right hand up for the uh, for the camera, <laughs> just to make sure that people go. can see all six right okay. there. Someone was looking for you. Well, hey. well, other thing I noticed is that you are maybe the only Aggie that I know that's not hired an Aggie. Right. So tell us about that real quick. <laughs> yeah, I am an Aggie. Uh, I'm a cause I'm a closet Aggie. I uh, I I've been to to one football game in 30 years. Whoa, I, heresy! I never make that whooping sound. <laughs> uh, I I never wear maroon. Uh, I drive an orange vehicle. Uh oh! <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> be careful! We're uh, gonna get hate mail. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I truly All right, that what website Aggies again. Call a, yeah, what Aggies call a two percenter. I am I am one. Well, hey, let's jump into the business <laughs> thing. So uh, you're an interior design firm. And you, uh, you, you know, you concentrate on commercial buildings, and I notice you've done office buildings, warehouses, industrial, retail, et cetera. But start us off by telling us what is the difference between an architect and an interior designer? Is there a difference? There is, and in in Texas, uh, the Texas Board of Architectural Examiners uh, licenses and TDLR licenses architects, landscape architects, and interior designers. So all three disciplines uh, carry state licenses, and we all have uh, we all have stamps or seals that we use to stamp our our plans. So landscape architects are primarily in involved obviously in uh, landscape <laughs> projects architects are primarily involved in uh, in the design of buildings and interior designers are primarily involved in uh, the design of what happens inside those buildings and so uh, we we people confuse us with architects and call us architects a lot because we draw plans for a living and we lay out, you know, uh, we lay out office spaces and and um, and draw lots of floor plans and electrical plans and ceiling plans and things that people associate with architects. And uh, we are uh, we are an interior design firm because, uh, in even though I've had a a uh, you know a degree from an architectural school for thirty years, I've never designed a building. Uh, all of our work has been uh, focused on uh, the interior of buildings, the the layout of, of office space for companies. So the ar architect does the shell building and you That's do the right. interior building. That's correct. Okay. And so does the architect, who hires you? Uh, we don't get hired by the architect. Um, our client is uh, is one of two entities. It's either the owner of the office building mm -hmm. or it's the tenant who's moving into that office building. And so uh, we can we can work for uh, either side of that equation. Do you, now, most, most often, though, do you find that you're being hired by one or the other of those? It's most often the owner of the office building, uh, but uh, that's it's probably a, it's probably a seventy thirty uh, okay. split between the two. Uh, so why would that? I mean, so what would cause a, a a business a building owner to hire you versus another firm? Well, we. As space planners, we're part of the owner's marketing team. So if you own an office building, you have a, you have a team of brokers who are in charge of leasing it for you. Right. And you have a team of space planners who are in charge of designing the floor plans in that building to help 
uh, fill it with tenants. Okay. And so uh, an owner would, a building owner would hire us because they uh, they need our expertise. They need our creativity to help sell their the space in their buildings mm. to uh, tenants out there who are looking for office space. So when I was a, a landlord guy a long time ago, I had a lot of office buildings I was responsible for. And one of the architects that we hired, architects, here, listen to me, one of the companies we hired to be the, <laughs> quote, architect of record, which mm-hmm. that's not the right term, but the interior designer of record was Andy Jones Commercial. Uh, you did a few buildings when I was with a company called CMD Realty Investors. and uh, But then we had other firms that did that as well. And so we, as the owner, wanted that architect or that interior designer to be there so that we had control and consistency and we kind of knew what we were getting and, and somebody who knew the building and could do a good job for us long term. So that that kind of makes sense. But um, let's take another uh, look at this. You mentioned in the, in some of the discussion we had earlier about the distinction between the art of design versus the business of design. Tell us about that a little bit. <laughs> Very uh, um it, it's huge. Uh, the, the art of design is what I learned in school, um, how to uh, solve a design problem. Uh, of course, back then it was on paper. You know, now it's on a screen. Sure. But the process of, uh, of solving a design problem is the same. Um, meeting the, the requirements, coming up with a, uh, a floor plan and creating an environment that uh, meets the needs of a company. Um, is is a process that um, we as designers learn in school and mm-hmm. then learn on the job. Um, but I never I never knew uh, when I was in school and, and shortly after school that I would one day be running a company, a design firm. Well, that's <laughs> that's not that's not about that, you know that's, that's, that's not art. That's different. the craft. <laughs> I never took a single you know entrepreneur class. I never took a single business management class. Um, I didn't know that I'd be doing this this for a living. The business of design. Dealing with uh, uh, sales, dealing with clients, uh, dealing with um, um, proposals and and uh, invoices and collection and hiring and firing and benefits—all of these things that you know I now do for a living. I so, so how I'm just curious. So how have you gone about learning that? I mean, you've been in business 20 years. So what what's been the biggest multiplier for you in that area? Realizing early. Um, in the life of the business that I was really only good at uh, really two of the the five things you have to be good at to run a business and hiring people who are very good at the other things, the things I was not good at, and uh, bringing them on board and sort of building a team Mm -hmm. so that we had all our bases covered. You have to understand what your weaknesses are, and you have to find a way to compensate for those weaknesses mm-hmm. in the business, um, or you or or you fail. All meaningful progress begins by telling yourself the truth, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't do that. Exactly. I was that. can do it better. Um, well, we're going to go ahead and, and go to a break, uh, but before we do, what impact can becoming debt free really have for an entrepreneur in their business? Stick around. And now, Confessions of a Recovering Landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, knowledge is power. We all negotiate from a position of power and strength, or at least we want to. In any negotiation, the party with the most knowledge probably has the upper hand. And landlords count on this being the case whenever uh, you're negotiating a lease because most landlords are professional real estate investors and they hire professional leasing agents and property managers. Landlords are in the market every day negotiating leases while tenants probably only negotiate one, maybe two leases every few years. So tenants feel outgunned. Don't let landlords have all the power. As a former landlord for 20 years, I understand how landlords think and what motivates them. So let me put that knowledge and experience to work on your side of the negotiation. To learn more, contact me at TexasTenantRep.com. Again, that's TexasTenantRep.com. Have you started making plans to take your business to the next level in 2016? Hi, I'm Stephen Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali. 
We have a trademark process called the Empowered Advantage that enables CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to more effectively buy and manage their insurance. Before sitting down to make your plans for the new year, here are just a few things to consider. Would you say that you have an actual insurance strategy, one that you can articulate, or have you just purchased a policy here and there over the years? If you have an insurance strategy, was it discussed under the pressure of a renewal deadline or considered earlier in the year to avoid fire drill decision making? If your answer was no to either of these questions, then you may not have the right partner on your team. Visit AlkaliServices.com to contact us and take the next step to a bigger and better future. This is Jared Frescus. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for ParkHub.com. And I always heard if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. So guys, it's time for me to go. Welcome back to The Next Level, conversations that propel business. We're here with our guest, Andy Jones, with Jones Commercial Interiors. You can find Andy online at AJCI.com. Where? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not going down that path with you again. All right. So, hey, I wanted to go back. Give us an understanding of sort of how did you get into this business and, uh, you know, how has it developed over time? I uh, I never uh, wanted to be a designer growing up. I never uh, uh, displayed any particular uh, artistic talent. I uh, always just assumed I'd grow up and be a pilot like my dad. That's just what I always wanted to do when I was as a kid. Um, went to A&M because my dad went there. He was class of 61. And uh, uh, my freshman year at A&M that, you know, I didn't even make it, you know, past the door of the engineering college where I assumed I would be going. Uh, I didn't even, why is that? wasn't even close to having the, uh, the math skills to, uh, <laughs> to, to even, uh, it's not that I didn't pass freshman calculus and freshman chemistry. It's that they wouldn't let me into freshman calculus. And freshman right. Chemistry. You know, there's going to be some engineers so. listening to this. So they're going to say, <laughs> so he failed at being an engineer. So he just became, a, he settled for being a designer. <laughs> wasn't exactly like that. Uh, I'm really happy to be a designer. Uh, but the, uh, they, they basically put me in general studies. Uh, they said, you're, you're, you need to go take some basic courses and let's see how you do. And so uh, I, I was in general studies my first semester at A&M and, and uh, didn't have a whole lot to do. And so I started staying up late with a, a friend of a friend who was an architecture major. And uh, um, this this uh, girl was always uh, just staying up till two or three in the morning, building models and drawing stuff. And that looked a lot more interesting than what I was doing, which was, you know, studying, you know, freshman, you know, history or, or whatever. It was. So, so you got into design, but what I was really fascinated by is, I mean, you took a pretty scary, bold risk to step into the entrepreneurial world. I mean, it I was, was starting the company. Yeah. It was yeah. either, either gumption or idiocracy. Uh, since you've been in business 20 years, I'm going with gumption but i mean tell us about that <laughs> it was uh <laughs> definitely uh some of both but having 10 years of experience in the industry it doesn't seem like a lot now looking back at it but i thought i had this this wealth of experience and i was definitely ready to go you know uh, take on the uh take uh, take over the world and so i uh i uh, left a uh very good job uh, where I had been for 10 years, I had very, very good. It was a very good, secure position with a uh, with a good architecture firm, and I um, uh, I was getting raises and bonuses. I was on the management team, and I just really had this um, uh, burning desire to go work for myself. I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to try it on my own, and uh, I. Uh, I left that company um, with a um, my my uh, wife was a uh, stay home mom. Uh, the kids were uh, three and seven, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> and I um, uh, I printed up a a bunch of postcards, um, just mailed them to everyone I knew, uh, subleased a thousand square feet of office space. Uh, Put a door on two sawhorses to make a desk. Um, Made it happen. Borrowed ten thousand dollars, bought a computer, and and uh, and and started a company. And here we are, almost twenty years later, this July. And one of the things I also noticed is so congratulations on Thank that. You. Yeah, that's, that's huge. huge. Um, 
it sounds like you're really facing maybe with the same type of challenge they had back then. I noticed that you said one of your biggest challenges is is retaining great talent. So talk to us a little bit about that. It's uh, it's a it's definitely a new day uh, as a as a 51 year old guy and as a, a kind of a borderline baby boomer Generation X kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it everything looks different now. Um, the the um, young design professionals, entry level zero to zero to three years of experience. Mm-hmm. The the people we're mostly interviewing and hiring and training. Uh, have a whole different view of the world than uh, than I had at their age uh, and at their uh, stage in uh, in their careers. And so, uh, I I am not a millennial basher. Uh, I I um, I like most of the millennials I meet and, mm-hmm. and and have the privilege of working with. I have an office full of millennials. Mm-hmm. Um, they're uh, this uh, this generation is is uh, is creative. Uh, they're they're smart. They're determined. They're ambitious, um, and they have a uh, an annoying habit of changing jobs a lot. Um, <laughs> so you hate it when they do do to you what you did to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did stay ten years. Well, okay. I did my own defense. I so they're leaving how quickly now? Uh, it's. It's. I think the average uh, for um, professionals in their twenties now is is somewhere in a year and a half, two and a half year okay. range, uh, at least in our industry. Mm-hmm. Um, young people move around a lot. Uh, they they change jobs, and they that's the way they move up in their careers. The way they plan their careers is they will change firms, and they're while they're working, even if they're happy, they're still always. They're still. They still always have their feelers Person out. Screening. They still right. always have their resume online. They're still, you know, sort of watching. Yeah, for the for the greener grass. And there's a lot of green grass out there. So where do they leave to go to? Normally, it's normally it's a it's a some other either another design firm that's a that's a competitor, or they'll leave to another a whole other segment of the design business. Okay. We've had you know people that decide you know they do office for a while and then they decide well I want to do hospitality I want to do nonprofit I want to do residential. Okay. And yeah. how are you? I mean, so what are you doing to combat that? That's got to be pretty disruptive. It's hard. Uh, we you know we spend a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, training entry level uh, professionals, and um, we uh, our our clients. What our clients want is a designer who is assigned to their account and stays on their account mm-hmm. for years. They'd take decades if they could get decades. That's that's what they want. They need that stability. They need that that designer on their account who's always going to be there when they need them mm-hmm. and understands their building. And so what we what we um, are what we're trying to figure out is, and I and I don't want to minimize it. I, we're not trying to figure out how to keep millennials happy. That's mm-hmm. not what it's about. That's not our job as an employer to make you happy. Sure. What we're trying to do. Good luck with that. Is figure out not any of us, not millennials. We're trying to do is figure out how to help them grow. How to how to figure out what they need in order to um, uh, sort of build a career, mm-hmm. build a future. Mm-hmm. We want them to build their career, build their future with us. The ones that we have, that we found, that we like, that we see a lot of potential in, mm-hmm. we're trying to find ways to uh, keep them challenged, keep them interested. Um, Do you think your new office space that you moved into only, what, a year ago is going to change anything? I mean, because you have such a cool office. Do you think that environment that is going to make any cha- difference in how long people want to stay with you? It, it should. We we hope it will. Um, we It certainly made a difference for me. I, I love that office. You know, um, it's, a, it's a great place to, to show up every day. But, you know, the fact is there's a there's a lot of cool offices out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of cool companies with uh, with cool offices and and, <laughs> you know, fresh fruit in the break room. So, you know, it's uh, it, it you that's an important component, but it's only one component. And there are there are many. So one thing I wanted to celebrate and just congratulations on is uh Debt free, becoming debt free. That's debt free was huge. That's I mean, we're my wife and I are 
Dave Ramsey and Bob is two endorsed insurance providers. I'm not, not sure if you know who he is, but he's I, very about being debt free. I'm a big fan. We've been debt free for a while ourselves. Huge blessing in our lives. How has that translated into the way that you run your business? And I mean, what, what type of impact? I want share that experience. We actually implemented uh, the the snowball. Oh, did you? Uh, did the you? dead snowball uh, at home and at the office at the same time. Wow! And the the company ambitious. And I personally and the company became completely debt free within a month of each other in 2015. Wow! That's and, huge. Uh, That's awesome. Wow! I mean, two two big uh, celebrations uh, were. Uh, it was. Uh, it took this giant uh, load off my shoulders yeah. that I'd been carrying since I was in my 20s. I, I started incurring debt at 21, 22. It's just as soon yeah. as I graduated from college, you know, I started borrowing money to buy cars and getting credit cards. And I started building my my <laughs> reverse debt snowball uh, start building my uh, my debt portfolio uh, up until I was um, in my 40s and then started you know started reducing it um, over the last uh, it took about it took about seven years uh, to go from my you know my peak of personal debt uh, to zero. Do That's you feel funny. that it enhanced your creativity? I mean, like, do you do you feel like having that pressure, that weight off? Oh, it, it's huge. I I don't, I, I don't know how much, uh, how many hours, and how much emotional energy I used to spend just trying to make sure that I got everything paid on time mm -hmm. to try to to try to preserve my my credit score which is also of course tied to the business there are there are personal guarantees required for a lot of the things we do as a business like a lease and i had to maintain my credit score so i had tons of pressure on me personally to get all my debts paid and then the company had that pressure in addition to payroll and rent and insurance and all the other things the company has to take care of the company had debt service to to uh, worry about and now all those things are all those things are behind us. So let me go back to one thing that you had alluded to prior to the break. You mentioned the five things required for business. What are those five things and how did you learn them? Well, I, I want to start this by giving Steve Waddell uh, the credit for this uh, this little uh, piece of wisdom. He, he was your mentor. He was so my mentor. He was my first employer. Uh, my Actually, my only employer besides myself. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Steve Waddell, over my first 10 years in the business, taught me everything I know. And what he taught me about uh, being a business owner is that there are five things you have to be good at uh, in order to be successful in business uh, you have to uh, you have to get the work you have to do the work you have to build the work you have to collect the money and you have to retain your people I like to collect the work best. Yeah. I collect the money. That's my favorite. Collect, collect the, the work. Money. Collect the work. Yeah. But you got to collect the work to collect and the money. That's I like my the money. least favorite because I am non-confrontational and there's nothing I hate more than calling a client and trying to get money out of them. What's next? What's next? Mm -hmm. What's next for you? Well, we're in this great position to grow. Um, we we've learned over the years that you're you know you, there is no leveling off, there is no static uh, uh, state in a business. You're growing or shrinking for the most part, and uh, we want to grow. We have a little space. Uh, we have plenty of work. We have, as I mentioned, no debt. Yeah, uh, we, you know, we've got a very good core, experienced staff of managers, and uh, and we're ready to take this thing, uh, to borrow a phrase, uh, to the next level. <laughs> well, thank you for that plug. Well, thank you so much, Andy, for having been our guest today. Really appreciate that. Uh, if you'd like to learn more thank about you. Andy, please go to ajci.com. And if you want to learn more about the Next Level Show. Uh, go to nextlevelshow.com where you can find today's conversation both in video and audio. And you can uh, also find us on social media. And you can find a special show after the show. What are three things uh, any listener can do right now, any business owner, to improve their space they're already in? Yes. So go to the show after the show online, nextlevelshow.com. Have a great week. You have been listening to The Next Level, conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. 
Join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level.